This panel is called How Can Labour Make Britain the World's Best Home for the Creative Industries? And right now, the UK is a global creative powerhouse. There's ex uh, creative industries generate nearly £110 billion a year for the economy, £50 billion a year in exports, that's one in seven pounds for exports, and employ over two million people. That's bigger than aerospace, automotive, life sciences, oil and gas. Ice is a really crucial sector. So a number of people brought together in the creative industries to try and put together some helpful ideas for the incoming Labour government that the party could consider. And I'm giving thanks to James uh, Burstall of Argonon, who can't be here today, but he has been critical to the process. We've had some fantastic sector level conversations. So now we're going to just outline some of our thinking. And I'm delighted that we're joined by Shadow Secretary of State, Caleb de Venner, who's been in the job for 34 days. Glad you counted. <laughs> um, and both the Conservative Party lasting 34 days as Secretary of State means you're doing very well. Indeed. <laughs> we are going to keep uh, the format of this panel discussion as far away from broadcast mode as possible. I want to bring you in as early as possible and you're allowed to make statements as well as ask questions, which is very, very exciting for the conference. <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce some um, experts from the creative industry. So John McVeigh, OBE, is the chief exec of PACT, which is the UK screen sector trade body representing and supporting independent production and distribution companies. He started his career in post-punk band The Visitors, and I had to mention that because I love post-punk, <laughs> moving into television as a producer. I'll show you the album. Yeah, <laughs> got producer, consultant, and trainer. He joined PAC 20 years ago and quickly scored a major success which, with the campaign that resulted in changes to the 2003 Communications Act, and that is the foundations for the UK having some of the world's most creative and commercially successful independent TV um, uh, companies. John is recognised as one of the most influential people in the UK TV sector and his knowledge of policy is second to none. Caroline Norbury OBE is the Chief Executive of Creative UK, the independent network for UK creative industries. And Creative UK is the voice of UK's uh, creative industry supporting creative talent, businesses and her work during the COVID pandemic to secure government support has been seen as absolutely critical in saving thousands of jobs in the sector. Caroline also sits in the Creative Industries Council and chairs the Investment for Growth Subgroup of the Council. Thangum Debonair is our new Secretary of State. For Shadow. Shadow, Shadow, sorry. Shadow. Uh, must be presumptuous at this conference. Uh, uh, for Culture, Media and Sport. And previously, she was Shadow Secretary of State for Housing and Shadow Leader of the House of Commons. She was elected to the 2015 general election. Thangum is a true polymath, starting a maths degree at the University of Oxford, while at the same time training as a cellist at the Royal College of Music. Before becoming an MP, she performed professionally as a classical cellist, including, including performing in this very city, Liverpool, for the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. So we're going to start with Thangum, then we're going to go over to Caroline, uh, then John, and then I'm going to talk through some challenges. So over to you. Thank you, Mike, and forgive me, I forgot my trusty fan, and I also forgot how hot it gets in these meeting rooms. Um, for anyone who's standing at the back, there are four seats down, five seats down here, if you do want to sit down, you're very welcome. Um, so did you say 35 days in the job? 34. 34 days in the job, mustn't get ahead of myself. Um, the reason that I made a bid to be in the economy debate for my first speech at conference, first time speaker at conference, tomorrow, is because I am prosecuting a case that the creative industries, as well as first and foremost, bringers of joy, are absolutely crucial engines of economic growth. And if, if Wales, yeah, thank you, I love the of applause. <laughs> if Wales is going to build more hospitals or buy more diagnostic equipment, which I want him to do, if Bridget's going to take the rack out of schools, there's lots of seats at the front, Simon, um, then we need that economic growth. And the creative industries are amazing amazing, dynamic, creative, includes in the name, uh, creative people who know how to create good jobs and growth and spread that around the country, but they need a government that's going to be on their side. And I think this week, was it last week, I've kind of lost all sense of time, as you do when you get to conference, it's like another time zone, isn't it? Um, the Conservative Party conference, it, I thought it was really noticeable that they talked more about culture wars than culture. And I just find that really incomprehensible because the Conservative Party is also supposed to believe in economic growth. 
and you would have thought they would have wanted to seize that ground. Well, I'm glad we are, because actually the Labour Party has a really proud history with the creative industry and the creative sector generally. It was Jenny Lee, if you don't know who Jenny Lee was, do look her up, an amazing role model for me, um, who was at the, the, the founding stages of the Arts Council, who was a prime mover of the case for the arts being a Labour thing. The Tories want us to think that the arts are only for toffs, and that's just not on, because actually arts and culture for everybody, if you think about the special occasions in your life, you can probably remember, if you, if you got married, what song was playing be a first dance. You can probably remember if you got divorced, what song you played when you went dancing with your mates. You can probably remember what film you saw on your first date with someone you really love. You can probably remember all sorts of things that are about creativity. And often without even really noticing. They're part of the backdrop of our lives. But behind that lie, skilled artists, musicians, writers, dramaturgs, directors, producers, but also technical people. And I want every child, every child, to be exposed to that range of opportunities for both joy and jobs. And that means reforming the curriculum and working with Bridget Phillipson. And Bridget will be obviously focused on what's in the curriculum. What I'm focused on is what's around the curriculum. And there's an argument to be made for it needs to be in the curriculum if you really want to change lives, and I agree with that. But the amount, volume, scale, and imaginativeness of what's going on outside schools is also quite wonderful, but it could be bigger, it could be better, it could be deeper, it could be stronger, it could be more linked to the curriculum. So part of what we're offering, but I think it's the key part that most people in the creative sector have told me they want most, is that focus on education because every child's talent matters. By the way, I think every child matters was an incredible slogan of the last day of government. We, we should you know, keep that in mind yes. because it really framed how we thought about everything. We were actually pretty good at three word slogans before it was fashionable. Um, in fact, no, I thought we made them fashionable, didn't we? <laughs> education, 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 yeah, that's three words. Um, but I mean, Tory education ministers wouldn't know that because they can't add up how much money you need to run a school. So I mean, that, that shows our commitment to creating that dynamic economy in the long run. Because if we educate four, five, and six year olds, they're not going to be in the workplace for another 20 years. So that shows that we are focused on the long term, on the pipeline of talent. The second thing that I think we should focus on is how we give the creative sector the tools it needs to do the job, which are often about regulatory change. They may be about our relationship with Europe, which is a big priority for me to get sorted out a visa touring waiver. But visa touring, I can never say it in the right order. The thing that you need to be able to tour without having to get a visa. <laughs> And also without having to do bilateral arrangements with each and every country. Um, so there's lots of things that we can do there to make the creative industry's lives easier, to make your opportunities better, often without spending any money at all, or at least not yet, which is good, by the way, because that's where we are, and you know why. It's not because we're mean, it's because the Tories crash the economy, and everyone needs to hold on to that, because it won't be like this forever. If the Labour Party gets in next year, we will I'm absolutely sure that we will have better growth and that will give us more to play with and then we will be discussing what we could do. But at the moment, we're talking about how you can make changes so that the obstacles are cleared out of the way for you if you're in the creative industries and the opportunities are there for you. So education and getting the creative industries to be able to perform economically and in the job creation and in the joy creation that I want for you. I have no idea how long I talked for then, Mike, but it probably wasn't what you wanted. No, that's exactly right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's not there's, there's, we're, we are in danger as always of vigorously agreeing. Oh, let's. <laughs> so, um, but I suppose uh, let's. I, I think, given my um, uh, my background, I, my background, my training is as a as a as a filmmaker, and for the last sort of twenty years, I've been working in not, not for profits. Um, developing the right sort of environment for creative businesses and for creative people to to thrive and to grow, and that that in, 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 that involves um, both uh, the work that we do with our membership. So that's listening to some of the biggest creative businesses in the country, talking to them about what matters to them. But also, we're a very active investor. So we invest in lots and lots of SMEs. We invest what would be about between five and seven million a year into small creative businesses all across the country. 
So we're able to really get into the detail of what makes those businesses tick, um, what the challenges are, um, and where, you, where we need to intervene to make a difference. So I thought, if you don't mind, I'll go into a little bit of granularity around some of these things. I think you're right to say, first and foremost, the thing that we have to fix is the creative curriculum. We absolutely have to make sure that the arts and creative skills are embedded within the curriculum, that they're not seen as enrichment, uh, that they're seen as part and parcel of what young people go to school for. We have a net, which talks about um, in increasing access, inclusion. We have a network to do that, it's called schools. Yes. <laughs> so it's the first place of entry for everybody. It ought to also therefore be the place that can provide that creative background, those creative skills. For all the reasons that you've said, yes, because they bring us joy, they make our towns and cities better places, they make us as people better people. But also, it's those sorts of skills that are going to equip us for all the types of businesses and business change and technology change that's coming down the well, it's come down the, it's come down the pipe already, but it's only going to increase. What you need are people who think creatively, who are agile, who are reflective, who know how to communicate. Those are, that, that's why you need the arts, but that's also why you need to prioritise creative skills. That's the first thing. The second thing that I'd like to see um, uh, on, the, on the agenda, I suppose, of the future Labour government is some investments, the investment in our cultural infrastructure. And I'd like to see that in two different ways, really. So first, there is the investment in people, so we've talked about creative curriculum. Um, the other is to look at how we train the people that we already have. John knows much more about this than me, so I'm going to let him talk a bit more about that. Um, but let's just say that I think there are so many things that we could be doing to actually both help employers to train people better, more effectively, um, but also um, invest in, more, in, in, the, in the sort of people skills that, that you need to run a business these days. The other thing, the other part of that cultural infrastructure, though, is investment more generally. Um, obviously, we are in a very different position than we were than we were in 1997. You mentioned Jenny Lee, but I think the other thing that you need that you know we need to remember is that it was the it was the Labour government of 1997 that actually invented the whole term creative industries. Yes, it was the it was the Labour government um, and Chris Smith who did the mapping that actually started to count what the creative industries was all about and actually gave us a baseline so that we, you know, we're in the position now of being a world leader but a part of that is because we, we actually know how to qualify it, we came up with the standards, we came up with the, the, the de definition, we came up with the taxonomy. Um, but what we, we haven't really done an awful lot more in the sort of 25 years since then really. Um, so lots of the ways in which we invest in culture and the creative industries are very much similar to how they used to be. So there's a way in which I think by looking at some of the leaders, leaders we already have, so for example, the National Lottery, we haven't looked at how you use the National Lottery for the last 25 years. So let's look at that. Let's look at a patient capital <coughs> approach. One of the biggest problems with any business, and, and actually with any service, is short-termism. Um, there, is, there is no reason why we can't have a 10-year investment strategy. Um, if we had that, we would have an awful lot more purchase over the money that we, the, 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 the smaller amounts of money that we have. I think we really, really need to recalibrate some of those investments. A few little ideas that I have, uh, some of which will be popular and some of which probably won't. Um, the first is really to look at um, a hotel tax. So one of the challenges we have in, uh, in, our, in the is investment in our cultural organisations. So you look at something like the National Theatre that, that is, um, how old is it now? 50 years now? 50 years old now, I think. Um, really needs investment in that estate. You look at, there are loads and loads of cultural buildings in <coughs> Scotland, a theatre I was in recently, holes in the roof. We haven't had that sort of infra infrastructure investment for years. If we could find a way in which we could actually take something from all of these, uh, all the amazing tourists that do come in, they want to go to our, they want to go to our cultural, uh, cultural venues. They go to our theatre. They come here precisely for that. There must be a way, perhaps, that you know, a t tiny tax on the hotels, which seems to work everywhere else in the world, that could work here. Um, 
the only other thing I want to say, I think, um, or two things really about money, the, the, and this might be a bit policy wonky. Um, one of them is that at the moment, in order to invest, in order to qualify for um, the research and development um, credit, so if you're a business and you invest in R&D, quite often you can get the tax credit back. If actually you're doing it and you're a creative company, you can't. So creativity and creative disciplines are outside the scope of R&D. That's just madness. That doesn't happen in other parts of Europe. It's a very, very simple thing that could be fixed that actually would probably be, you know, I think it would probably be, I know actually, it would be net net to, to, the, to the exchequer. So that's one thing we can do. And the last thing that I think we can do that is a, um, a sort of a financial intervention is take all of the various, there are lots and lots of tiny little bits of uh, financial products, financial services that we already do, we already provide, but there's no plan that sits on top of it all. If we, if we actually did some clever thinking and thought about how all of these various <coughs> interventions, the tax credits, etc., all work together, sat everybody around a table in the way that they have, for example, in the social enterprise sector. So in the social enterprise sector, you have um, big society capital, which has, for I think it was something like a £400 million investment, now put £10 billion over the last 10 years into the social enterprise sector. We need that sort of type of intervention into the creative industry sector. And I think if we did that, we would see probably you know, 10 times £10 billion actually coming into the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. <coughs> and thank you. Uh, really good um, <coughs> points, which have been rattling around for some time. And I uh, hope we'll see at some point in the near future some change so we can see some of these things actually happening. Um, I represent PACT, which is a trade association, completely private sector, no public money. Uh, we have 850 SMEs, so if this is SMEs for labour, well, and they for the 850 um, <coughs> from all across the country, making all sorts of different types of product, films, TVs, animations, two people sitting in Starbucks, start a business, through to global scale businesses. One of the reasons why the British independent sector is the most successful in the world, uh, and this was touched on uh, by Mike, was the Labour government's 2003 Communications Act. Uh, I had just started that pact, we lobbied to get the law changed, the indie sector then was worth about 600 million gross. Uh, last year we posted sector turnovers of 4 billion. So and the reason why that changed is because the Labour government legislated that my members owned the copyright in their productions when debated for a domestic broadcaster. That fundamentally changed the business. So for those naysayers who say things can never change, they can. <coughs> you just need political will and vision. It was a big risk. I, I had many sleepless nights. I didn't know whether we would actually do the business. Uh, not anymore. Half of our revenues comes from non-UK earnings. Yep. So we're one of the biggest exporters. We make more shows for America than most American companies. So we're actually a global success and an exemplar uh, for many other parts of the economy. Uh, so it can be done. We've grown exponentially. We rely on lots of freelancers, self-employed contractors. Yep. We often get a bad rap because they're often described as gig economy. They're not. They're school technicians, creatives. A writer is self-employed. Picasso was self-employed. They're all self-employed. Yep. So I, one of my pleas is can we please support self-employed people, recognize the immense value they bring to the creative economy and indeed in other sectors. Mike's a probably self-employed yes, uh, consultant, and I'm sure there's a few more in the room. <coughs> um, so for us, that's that's an important part uh, of how the labour market should be seen. SMEs are really important. We are really good at what we do in the creative economy. I've got members who are now working in Hollywood. Um, succession was done by a British writer. <coughs> um, so, you know, we are very good at this. I, I've had numbers of delegations from Korea and China and Singapore. They come over and they go, why are you so good at this? I go, well, we're sort of Brit. And they go, what does that mean? I go, well, I'm Scottish, they're Welsh, she's South Asian, you know, we're very diverse, we're very different. <clears throat> that brings me to one of the key assets we have in our creative economy, our diverse talent. Yep. Yeah. We, have, we have so many stories in a talent 
tangle at Lyman's, which is not homogenous, it's not celebrating some mythical past, unlike some parts of maybe America. Um, we are a modern, progressive, dynamic, radical culture. Yeah? You look at Stormzy, the mainstream wouldn't help him, so he did it himself. Yeah? That is an exemplar, but also when I give speeches to the National Film and Television School and other academic institutions, where people say, oh, I'm going to set up a YouTube channel and make millions, I go, well, why do you want to do that? There's six billion pound of TV investment sitting on the table. Why not try and get into that? And the response is often, no one will take the calls. Yeah? So for me, inclusion is the big missed opportunity over the past 10 years. We need to be more inclusive in our arts and our creative economy. I want to see new entrepreneurs from diverse backgrounds from all parts of the country, not only because if you join my business, then they'll pay me more money, um, but because we're missing out on talent. We're missing out on people who can add value, not only to us just as in terms of our own personal, cultural, and our mental health, in a sense, but also for our economy. One of the biggest barriers which Carling and I, Dinah Kane in the room and Neil Hatton in the room, have been engaged in as members of the Creative Industries Council for the past Too long. 10 years <laughs> is reforming the apprenticeship system, yeah? which is a brilliant idea. You earn while you learn. Yeah? You can go to mum and dad and go, I want to be a camera operator. Oh, isn't that some wacky, crazy thing? No, no, there's a qualification. I can go and get trained. I can earn money, I'm not going to go into debt on a student uh, uh, loan, often for a course that's irrelevant to the industry. You can learn on the job vocational training. It has never worked for the creative economy because the creative economy is mostly SMEs with short term contracts. And the apprenticeship system is set up for full time fixed employment with rigorous hours. There was a pilot done recently <coughs> by one of our uh, training industries with Netflix. What was interesting that it costs more money to get an apprentice through this system than it would have if the employers had gone off and done it themselves. That's absurd. We are paying in, the great economy is paying in somewhere between 70 to 90 million pounds a year to the current government, which is hypothecated to subsidise other parts of the economy. We're not getting it back. Yet we have a major labour market problem, we have a skills crisis, we want more people. So one of my pleas to the incoming Labour government uh, and to thank them as our culture secretary is please radically reform the apprenticeship system. We, we have the jobs. If we could use some of that money to help make uh, freelance multi-contract working more flexible, if we could use some of the money to develop better qualifications to it, if we could be more flexible on the training, I have employers who would want to take those people on, big and small. And I know from speaking to all the US companies that invest heavily in our economy and our British broadcasters, they would do the same. So for the audiovisual sector, but I know across the creative economy, this has been a huge mission opportunity. And I, when I go around to speak at various events, I would love to say to someone, go and do an apprenticeship. It'd be amazing. And I can't, I can't truthfully say that to them. Instead, they're going to look at maybe going into debt in a, on a course that actually isn't going to deliver the skills that they need. So for me, though, that's one of the most fundamental changes because that would drive inclusion from social mobility, ethnicity, from location. Second point is place. A lot of our investment, thankfully to people like Channel 4 and the BBC, more and more of our spend in broadcasting is being made outside of London, and that's good. But we don't have enough of the clusters around the country to sustain the service sector because you don't just have to be a creative. You can actually work in construction. You can work in craft skills, joinery, painting, decorating. Those are skills we also need when we when we have when we have to film on location or in the studios. And we need to see more clusters developing. Our domestic broadcasters are doing what we can. Some local authorities, we're working very closely with the Northeast, who are doing fantastic things on business development. But that needs to be something more structured, to Caroline's point, a bit of a plan about how we do that, because if we can build those clusters, it built with along with investment strategies, we can actually create sustainable creative hubs. Not everywhere, okay, just be clear, not every single little town in the country can do that, but somewhere you could commute to, well, if the trains work, um, <coughs> where there would be opportunities for our talented young people uh, to find work, good quality work that can lead you to Hollywood. 
and going up to get nominated for an Oscar. Those those are all real things that have happened. But I've, wor I've been very worried, and a lot of my colleagues in the creative economy have as well, is we've missed an opportunity to try and really develop that. Frame the conversation. I'm just going to outline a few challenges, and then we're going to have um, interventions from the audience. So, because uh, I run a private business, I'm allowed to make a political point. Um, if we get a Labour government coming in in a year's time, it will be one of the few. The UK will be one of the few countries in the world with a progressive majority in Parliament. Actually, it will be unusual. Unfortunately, Europe is moving to the populist right. We don't know what the outcome of the US presidential elections will be. So, Britain's international reputation. Is going to change. People will be looking at Britain in a different light for the first time since 2016. And there might be a little bit of a moment of optimism. But what culture is really good at is, is framing national narratives as who we are as people and telling different stories about who we are as people. And actually, that's the benefit of culture. That's why culture is so important and why culture needs to be uh, nurtured. But we've also got in the UK a track record of having brilliant industries and letting them away. We were the world leader in shipbuilding until 1976 when we built 134 vessels. I'll let this up earlier. By 2011, we built four ships. It's because we didn't invest, we didn't put things forward. And just because the UK is a creative leader now does not mean the UK, the UK will be a creative leader in the next 20 years. We have to protect, um, we have to protect the creative industries. And we've had a really destabilizing period of all the debates around Channel 4 privatization, attacks on the BBC, etc. We've also got the challenge of artificial intelligence, which John, if you're looking at, do you want to say a few words about artificial intelligence? <coughs> yeah, well, this, this has happened. Uh, I'm sure you're all playing with it, uh, getting your um, speeches written for your minister, uh, shadow minister, uh, using ChatGPT or whatever it is. It, it's happened in our sector, it's been, we've been using AI for years. Um, <coughs> it's not a new thing uh, when it comes to post production. Most of the things you see on telly, if they're uh, a drama, are fake. Yep, just to be clear, so uh, we, that's fine. It's called fiction. We're telling a story. So, uh, so um, AI to us represents uh, three distinct things. One, massive opportunity to increase and enhance uh, efficiency and productivity. Two, it will lead to transformative job change. For instance, if you're an editor, someone who cuts all the everything together, one of your first dreary jobs when you start you have to log up what's called the rushes, everything you filmed. You have to log that with time and describe it and do the metadata. You can now get a bit of AI that will do that. So that's an entry level position which is changing. So we have to rethink how those jobs are going to look in the future. The other point is copyright and IP. How are those models being trained? Yep. Are they being trained on my copyright work or your book or your speech? or whatever it is. The UK is a powerhouse of IP generation. How are those things being trained? And how do we know that? And how do we control that? That's before we even go into deep fakes and what that might mean in terms of elections. But for copyright, which is what I represent, 850 copyright companies, this is really worrying, but also an opportunity because we can see how we can use this technology to do things much cheaper than how to spend a million pound in a post-production house to actually achieve that. And of course, for our next-gen creatives, that's even more exciting because they're digital natives already. So the big problem we see coming down the track, now, I, I gave a speech, I was chatting to some people at Conservative Party Conference last week, um, and I was saying, look, we need some sort of collective global approach to this. And why can't the UK be a leader in this? I said, well, we sort of got something called the UN for intellectual property. It's called WIPO. World International Property Organization. The only thing is it's really ineffective. So what we're going to see in AI, and this is this is where the UK has got to really navigate carefully, we're going to see an American system, we're going to see a British system, our government is currently looking at exceptions um, on this and consulting on this, and we're going to see a European system. Now, of course, AI is out of the box and it's global already. The other big problem we have to watch for is where bad actors go to locate their technology and then how they use that. Is it out of scope? Is it something we can't actually get jurisdiction over? So <clears throat> for us, AI is one of those, and I think it's really important all government departments think carefully about what the impact of AI is. It's because it is profound. 
and some of the stuff I've seen uh, uh, is not even released yet, and it's even more profoundly challenging and exciting and disturbing than anything you can see in the public domain. So it is something I would encourage, and that's why I was speaking at a Conservative Party conference to say, you really need to get on top of this. The genie's out the bottle. It's a way down the track, and it's evolving. Every time we use it, it evolves. And every time they use our songs or the Beatles songs to generate music in the style of the Beatles, there's an issue around that. So I mean, genuinely, my next door neighbour two doors down is a global expert on AI. He literally built part of DeepMind as a technologist. And the other day, he was joking that he doesn't know what he wants his son or job or son, or son to do because he's like, actually, I keep going through professions. I can see how you can AI your way out of this solution. Like, it's like genuinely, he's like, I don't know what job. And, the thing he's thinking is crazy. There's certain roles that you just cannot use AI to. Um, to to yeah. John's earlier point around inclusion, I think the thing about AI is that, as John says, we've been using it forever. It's not a new thing. What is new, however, is the speed yeah. Of, yeah. of change and the speed of, of, of growth. Um, and the whole sort of self, self-learning element of it. The challenge, going to your point around inclusion, is who's building it. Yes, it's got who, are, yeah. who are those? Who are those people that are um, putting in that those codes? Who are um, uh, who are sort of shaping the lens of that AI? And, and you, you know, you mentioned you know, what the Americans are doing and what the Europeans are doing. Actually, I think it's very. I think what Britain is doing at the moment is largely relevant. To be honest. Yep. You know, but what you didn't mention is what the Chinese are doing. The Indians doing what the Russians are doing. So there, there is the, there is there is a need, I think, around AI, AI for a global um, alignment on this, and that's why we need, as a nation, to really lean into this and lean into it actually with not a, a preconceived idea of what good looks like, because because this has to be something that is relevant to many different cultures many different perspectives around the world and we really really need to I think actually be quite humble in this we have we absolutely have to, to protect all the economics that, that, that John has talked about but actually I think this the social challenge is so much more frightening if people do not align around uh, how to use this technology for good rather than for and I think to follow on from that, that and picking up from John's point about inclusion and diversity, that's why you have to ask of every part of every sector, and I would include AI in this, where are the women, where are the people of colour, where are people from working class communities, where are disabled people, where are LGBTQ plus people, because without that diversity you don't get all the right questions. And if you want a homogenous AI, just have one demographic group, or maybe two. And if you want challenging questions to say, actually, is this okay? Is it not okay? Should we be bringing something else in? Should our algorithm or whatever it is that we're going to develop that your your friend knows already is going to put people into new jobs? I was going to say people out of jobs, so I'd prefer to say into new jobs. Right. But we had that in the Industrial Revolution, and it was difficult for people who had their jobs in industries that were going to become extinct. That's hard. That's where you get your identity. As a musician, uh, now a happy amateur, but you know, m- lots of professional friends. It terrifies me the idea that somebody might decide, whatever you say, that actually my original way of interpreting something is worth sacrificing for something that's cheaper. And AI can do that already. AI can absolutely. By the way, as, as John said, it's been able to do it for some time. We've had electronic music for some time, and that's why in the 1970s, my cello case and everyone else's had a sticker on it. Yours probably did too, not your cello case, but you know, whatever. Had a sticker on it saying "Musicians Union says keep music live." We didn't win that argument, and it wasn't a valid argument in the end to win because lots of us actually got our living in recording. Music, but we had to find new ways to protect our terms and conditions and new voices to stand up for us and say, okay, well, we're working in the studio, that's that's great, loads of jobs, loads of new things we can do, but we also need to make sure that that's the good terms and conditions. We had to think ahead then, we'll have to think ahead now. And I want to come to the audience.